There is sure a lot of blindness in these stories. If we start with the story of Samuel heading off to Bethlehem, Samuel still not quite trusting in God because um, there's uh, a king to deal with whose name is Saul, who's still the king and who watches all of his subjects carefully, pretty ruthless, and uh, Samuel knew that uh, if he were to head off and anoint a new king, uh, his life might be in some jeopardy. Samuel, still not sure uh, about uh, trusting in God, uh, says, uh, can I make up an excuse? God says, sure, here's an excuse. Tell him that you're going down to Bethlehem, you're going to make a sacrifice, and then when you're there, uh, invite Jesse. We've got the community leaders who think they know what's up, uh, and they say, uh, do you come uh, peaceably rather than, than and with an army behind you? And uh, he says, sure, I come peaceably. I just came to worship God to have sacrifice. And then he invites the family of Jesse and uh, says, bring your sons. Samuel looks at the first son and says, uh, well, good-looking young man, uh, I think he would be an excellent choice for a king because uh, we always look at what people look like as the first criteria for testing relationships. And God says, ah, no. And Samuel backs off a bit, and Jesse brings in the second son, and Abinadab, nice-looking young man, no. Shammah, no. Seven sons down the line, no. Any others? Well, yeah, there's one. He's out in the field looking after the sheep. He's just a kid. Uh, bring him in. We learn in the process that God judges not by appearances, but God judges by what's in a person's heart. A different way of seeing, a different perspective on how you uh, make choices about leaders and about how you uh, discern God's leading. Kind of interesting, the first thing we learn about David, though, is that uh, while he had a ruddy complexion, he was also had beautiful eyes, and he was a good-looking kid. Uh, can't get away from that appearances thing, but it seems that God's also testing other things, and Samuel knows his eyes are opened, and he sees that this one is to be God's king, the next king of Israel, and he anoints him. Samuel's eyes are open to a new way of following God, a new way of discerning uh, God's way of choosing, using the heart rather than the surface, the look at people on the surface. Samuel's eyes are open. The Jesus story, a long and complicated one, could work, Marie. As we hear the story, center stage, a man who's been born blind. So in other words, it wasn't any disease or it wasn't any closing of the eye or an infection or anything that it caused. He's been blind from birth. There's nothing you can do about that kind of thing. We all know that. If the eye's not developed, it's not going to be able to see. Disciples say, uh, what's this about? How come he's blind from birth? Do you think it was his sin or was it his parents' sin? Disciples haven't a clue. A lot like the rest of us. We ask questions without really realizing that at the depth of those questions is a question. You never get an answer as to why somebody's born blind. It's not because of anything except the way the world works and genes that sometimes don't click in when they're supposed to or uh, brokenness that comes about in utero or at the time of birth. We don't know the answer to those things. Jesus reminds us that it isn't something that God chooses. It isn't something that God causes. God doesn't happen to visit evil on some of us and good on others. God's wish is that all of us be whole. 
and we live in a world where some of us are broken. Jesus then does the pace thing, puts mud on eyes, sends him off, the blind man comes back and he can see, and Jesus disappears from the stage for the next 20 verses. And everything focuses on the blind man. This guy had been a beggar for all of his adult life. He'd probably learned to beg as a kid. That was a time in which people would have felt sorry for him. He hadn't had an education. He would have picked up bits and pieces of knowledge on the street. But he would have been one who, with few skills and little ability, little sense of prospect, his parents probably worried what would happen to him when they were gone. And now he's center stage. The Pharisees come and say, what's this all about, this seeing thing? We don't believe that you were blind all along. And three times the Pharisees come back and they say, well, how, how can you be, have, how can you have sight when you were born blind? You must not be telling us the truth. You're not really the one who was born blind. Boy, talk about not seeing. So they ask his parents, is this the one? He says, they say, yeah, this is our son. He was born blind. And each time they ask the son and say, uh, how did this happen? He explains patiently. Jesus took some mud and or some soil, or some dust and spat on it and turned it into a paste and put it on my eyes and I went to the pool of Siloam and I washed off and then I could see. They ask him again. He says, well, wait a minute, I told you the story already. What's this about? How come you're having such trouble seeing? The blind man says to the Pharisees, to the religious and community leaders, how come you're having such trouble seeing? They call in the witnesses. They're trying as hard as they can to discredit Jesus. The blind man keeps saying, this is what I experienced. This happened in my life. And I think Jesus is a prophet. I think Jesus is one who's come from God. I experienced his healing as a gift. I don't see him as one who's away from God, instead as one who's close to God. Pharisees keep trying to stir things up. They've already said that if anybody says Jesus is from God, they'll get kicked out of the synagogue. The man's parents dodge answering the question because uh, they don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. And they say, hey, he can speak for himself. And he says, yeah, Jesus put paste on my eyes. I can see and I know that, God, that Jesus is a healer. How is it that we discern God and Jesus' presence in our lives? See, that piece in the middle of the passage, the gospel passage, all about the blind man, little about Jesus. Jesus isn't even on the scene. If we pay attention in the gospel of John, there are a lot of places where there are these conversations that are kind of off to the side conversations we're to understand that they were conversations that John includes in the gospel in part to address issues that the congregations of the church of the future were dealing with. John was one of the longest lived disciples of Jesus and his gospel was written 75 years after Jesus was gone. So John was aware of what were the issues the church was facing. And one of the issues that the church was facing was the hostility of the mainline culture, the Jewish community. They were a subculture, and the main culture was hostile to Christians. People, if they said Jesus, were being kicked out of the synagogue, asked to leave the community. 
people were also wondering, how can we speak of who Jesus is with authenticity and also with power? And we listen to the story of the man born blind and we see that it's indeed a prescription for followers of Jesus who live in a hostile world to be able to address or to speak of Jesus. How is it that you trust in Jesus is the question that John's posing. I once was blind, but now I see Every one of us would have some sense that there's a time in which we've said, yeah, I experienced Jesus in my life, in power, when this happened. When one of our sons was two years old, he had a series of seizures and ended up in hospital for five days. They said it might be a tumor, it could be a clot, it could be a disease, and they did x-rays and this two-year-old got poked and prodded with blood and intravenous and x-rays and tests. And at the end of it, the doctor said, uh, we really don't know anything. By our tests, we've not found anything that tells us what's ahead and so we've really not ruled anything out we hope it's a one-time thing and on that Sunday I was preaching and it was one of those passages that in which Jesus says to his disciples uh, don't be afraid and I preached on the subject don't be afraid and how do you do that when every fiber of your being is scared to death about what's going to happen? I, in the midst of my terror about what might happen, found a peace in me that allowed me to say to the community, I know God's peace in the midst of my fear and terror. And you've had experiences like that too. And when you say those words to a doubting secular community, people's ears perk up, their eyes open in a way that they've often not, and people grow curious about spirit possibility in a way that has power. The Pharisees who listened to the man's story heard, I was blind, Jesus acted in my life, I li my life was changed, I can see, and now I know who Jesus is. In our interfaith dialogue with other faith traditions, one of the issues that we have sometimes to deal with is the reality that Jesus isn't the same for Muslims and Jews and Hindus as Jesus is for us. And we find that all we can speak about in those conversations is our own life experience. This is what I know. This is what I've experienced. This is the way in which God's been present in my life. And when a community across faith traditions engages in that dialogue, sometimes walls can come tumbling down. Sometimes relationships and trust can open up. I should tell you, because you're hanging, our son, who's almost 40 now, a PhD in biomedical engineering, and a business consultant and making more money than I can ever imagine and with a family and stability, he's fine. It took us years to trust that that was going to be the case. But in my heart, I knew God's presence healed 
I was okay. Whatever came about, I could trust that God would be with me. Be not afraid. The blind man found an eloquence that allowed him to address the leaders of a hostile community around him and make his claim. I experienced this. I saw this. And now I claim this. Jesus, Lord of my life, Jesus, the one in whom I find my rest. Jesus, the one who fills my heart with possibilities. And in claiming that, there's a shift that goes on in the church, in the faith community, around that blind man, in the church of that day. We discover a courage that surprises us and a compassion that encourages us. We're invited now to be the ones who are the eye-washers, the doubt-touchers, the healers, the ones who, having experienced God present in our lives, dare to believe that God, through our hands, through our actions, through our walk, might be discoverable to the community around us. And that when that we, walking in steps of Christ, walking in way of Christ, might be to the world light, sight, vision, dream, possibility. May we be inheritors of God's promise. Yes, Jesus in me. May we be tellers of Christ's story, offered life for me. May we be guarantors of God's promise, love for each one around us. May we be hands and feet of Christ. May our world experience God's promise. In the midst of fear, a promise. God's love, no limits, no end, no matter what. Thanks be to God that we see that our vision is restored and that we know life in fullness.